Really privileged to be joined by Tobias Hooten, who is a tech CEO for over 17 years. And he's been on a few of our podcasts before. Uh, I went and visited him before he, uh, he sold his company uh, a few years ago. And yeah, I'm really excited to kind of chat to you about tech jobs because I know you've got like masses of, uh, masses of information uh, up there around this. So thank you so much for joining me. I promise it's a pleasure. Yeah. So what would you say to someone who was kind of looking to get a job in, in technology and, and they were kind of a little bit sort of stuck with, um, with their life? They were perhaps, perhaps they started out as, um, as a developer, you know, recently uh, they just, just sort of learned a couple of languages, a couple of coding languages like Python and whatever. Like what, what would you sort of say to someone who was, in that position and they and they were looking to kind of uh, improve and, and move forwards in their career. I know it's a big question to start out with, but it's just someone sprung to mind and I've introduced him to a recruiter friend of mine. So I think it'd be helpful uh, for him if you could share a bit of insight into that. That's a, that's a hell of a question to start with. Um, the world will be their oyster currently. If we look at the, the landscape of technology at the minute, um, what used to be called DevOps, or the, the gap between development and integrating applications and operations is a huge void right now. Um, historically, there was always sort of back-end, front-end development, and it's been in the middle of sort of business development technology. And it's all, over the years, it does this sort of concertina thing where everything becomes very disaggregated, and then the gaps close up again. And we're somewhere at the minute between concertina expanding again and being expanded. And the market right now for front-end and back-end developers is very, very buoyant. At the same time as actual good generalists tend to have, <laughs> if you've got any appetite for it, really good generalists as well in development are really hard to find. If you look at the sort of career trajectories of anything post a senior developer or a development team lead, how do people get out of being a developer and into wider business exposure roles? It tends to come from having more generalist skill sets backing them as well as good communication skills and good analytical skills and, and um, the ability to, to instruct and work and develop their own team. But developers aren't just sc scored really based on their own technical skill set. They need to have very good generalist skills as well. And certainly when we recruit developers, I'm looking for candidates that are technically good for their particular moment in time, their particular role. But actually they're very, very good with some very good of generalist business skills, communication skills as well. I think that's what will set people up longer term um, and, and prove their flexibility to go outside their existing software development position. That's, uh, that's very interesting. Very similar to, uh, to one of my guests uh, on the security interview that we did. He, he runs uh, Brim, which is um, rolling out the cybersecurity centers for the UK in partnership like with the government and that sort of stuff. And he said exactly the same thing. So, you know, go in and learn the business skills. I mean, a lot of people, they're obsessed, it seems, to be working for the big corporations. They're obsessed yeah. uh, to go in and work for, you know, the essentials of the world, et cetera, et cetera. But actually, he, he, he was not impressed by that. He's like, well, actually, it's better that you go into a small business, learn how a business actually runs instead of going out and going to some sort of major, major brand. Do you kind of agree with, with what he was saying there, Toby? Yeah, I do. And I think it's very easy to move into a, into a white collar consulting firm like a PwC or an Accenture or a Deloitte later on in, in your career, if you so wished. I mean, they have some fantastic grad schemes. And one of the reasons why you see junior developers and early developers going into those companies is because they do have well-formed departments with good structure. And you can, if you want to, make a career of progressing through the ranks of you know, consultant, partner, manager, and so on and so forth in those firms. But from experience, having worked with some of those firms, and it's not all individuals in those firms, they tend to become a bit one trick. And actually, those firms are focused on integrating applications as opposed to developing from the ground up applications. If you're a junior developer, and I saw this yesterday, one of the best tools you can learn is Google, which is kind of true. Um, but if you go and work as a junior developer for a development house, or you go and work for a, a actual software company, you'll develop your software skill sets and your development skill sets far faster than you would do in a consulting firm like an Accenture or a PwC or a Deloitte. But in those companies, you would develop 
your communication skills, your analytical skills, your team skills much faster than you would do in a development house. So it's sort of a quid pro quo where I see lots of success in, in aspiring developers that are post junior, post sort of two, three, four years PQE is where they end up moving into a consulting firm like that, but they have the three or four years of development experience underneath them, which makes them extremely capable individuals. Yeah, that, that makes that makes a lot of sense there. Makes a lot of sense. So what sort of areas then are you excited about the most in, in, in technology uh, at the moment in, as far as like growth areas? Because I've been sort of looking, I've been looking at like uh, the WEF and, you know, there, there's so much disruption as far as these jobs are concerned. I'm looking over here on my second screen and it's like, it's just crazy. Like the amount of job. I mean, they say by 2025, this is what they're saying. They say that the jobs, 85 million jobs may be displaced and 97 million new roles might appear is basically what they're saying. But what I also found very interesting was that in parallel, um, an additional 69 million teachers will need to be recruited in the coming years to reach global education targets. So with that in mind, like what, what, what excites you the most, like in terms of like the way that, those are going to change, do you think? I think true AI is a really interesting space currently, and that's drawing a clear distinction between what was old-fashioned AI, i.e. machine learning, and what now is true AI organization. And I watched again the other day the AlphaGo video, and you can watch it if you watch AlphaGo on YouTube, which is a story of a team of developers that built the first true AI application to beat the world's best players at Go. And that application story is really interesting. It starts off with effectively a machine learning application that was trained by watching other games and watching the best masters in the world. And it soon started to play moves that no one had ever thought to play. Some really radical moves. And it's like playing a game of chess and moving a piece completely out of the field of view. And you go, well, why has that happened? But the application knew what was happening. And it's the, one of the first really elegant expressions of a true AI-based application, truly thinking for itself. And of course, there's stories from things like Google as well, where they wrote the code to, to seed their AI engine and, and then Google rewrote itself, which is kind of scary, but it's going to happen. Um, so the whole AI space is quite exciting in general currently. There's also some really geeky technology things happening, like you know, a month ago, the RFC for HTTP3 came out. It's a brand new technical standard for how the web will effectively work. And the same is happening in other areas as well of development and, and technology currently. There are people are rewriting the rule book of, of how the old fashioned technical landscape used to work. And that's happening because applications, businesses, users now consume data in different ways. Um, big data and big data analytics is also an area that's actually quite exciting, although it sounds pretty dull. Um, understanding more from the data that we have. Look at climate tech, for example, and ecotech and environmental tech right now. What's really driving the actual coalface development of some of those new applications and platforms and technology is a deep understanding of globalized climate data. And that's only done by a combination of big data and AI. I'm, I'm, I'm nodding away here. Yeah, uh, because because like, uh, you know, the things that AI can do and the things that, you know, analyzing more data can do, it, it's it's mind blowing. Right. I mean, I know we have a mutual friend like Michael Tobin and we, we did an interview. Uh, let me see. Probably. <clears throat> yeah. Michael Tobin, OBE and I, we've done like multiple interviews. Right. And I and I when you said you knew him, I was like, oh, he knows him. That's interesting because it is a small space. Right. The cloud. And, 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 you know, where, where you are uh, in business, it's a small, it's a small area, right? When you get to a certain, certain level. And he was saying that he actually likes the fact that, 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 that these companies know all about him because it saves him time. <laughs> and, uh, you know, because it's like, well, okay, so this company, they know that I've, that I'm going to run out of this, or they know the lifespan of this item that I have. And then they get to advertise in front of me or just give me a little nudge and remind me that I might need it. And, do you know what? I actually think that they know us better than we know ourselves. A lot of these companies. I was saying this to my daughter the other day, and it's and it's it's just fascinating that you know there are other people on the other side of things that are really private and they don't want anyone to know anything about them. 
and I, and 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 I just thought it was quite refreshing that he that he has that opinion around around data and you know having these sorts of uh, openness to it, right? But but what fascinates me is that the AI right now and actually using these models to train the AI and those models can just be put straight in, right? Like it's like a module, isn't it? That they just take it and it's like I need this data because I want to train a model and just stick it straight in there right it's fascinating all this stuff it's yeah, um it it's, it's incredible yeah so it's also it's also old hat mm -hmm. too right so ai has been around since as long as things like tesco club card were first involved people think about ai as being a new thing but if we talk about ai as being learning from data for a second which is in effect what it is in its purest sense then that concept has been around for a very long time and i you know i come from a security background my background is all security and I sort of had this internal conflict a while ago that between security, anonymity, and I think there's a fair balance to be struck. You have to accept that in a modern day and age, you are being tracked. If you have car insurance or home insurance or a mortgage or a bank account, you already have data being collected about you anyway, which is pretty much everybody in the world. So there's always a level of data. It's just how much we're prepared to share. And actually, you are perversely sharing more if you have less about you because the information that you are sharing is more distilled to draw a greater spotlight. If you're sharing more data, you sort of disaggregate by form. So there's a few nuances to that thought process that I think are quite interesting. I I do agree with, with Michael Tobin's perspective there about, you know, it is very helpful. Um, there is definitely a fair balance. I suppose the conversation isn't really what data you're sharing, it's what your data being used for. And that's a whole different conversation, a whole different topic. Um, but yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So... You know, I mean, throughout this this series so far, everybody I've interviewed, they they kind of say, look, you know, it's perfectly normal that jobs are going to be displaced. The people that are going to, in essence, be uh, forced into learning something new are the people who who don't want to change and don't want to learn. Right? I mean, you're, I know you, you're similar similar to me and Kim. Like, we're lifelong learners, right? Like, yeah. we just want to learn stuff. Like, if there's something new that's exciting and it's and it's and it's important, like we just want to learn it, right? But like, but like a lot of people, like complacency is, in my personal opinion, is like the 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 biggest. Uh, issue for for people because they're going to be displaced and they're going to be like well I, I can't really do anything right now and and I'm sort of stuck and it's like yeah and then they're going to go through this whole cycle of blaming other people and 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 not look at themselves and say well actually perhaps it was me perhaps I needed to change or or learn something new myself right so have you got anything to sort of say about that Apart from that, I agree. <laughs> I mean, so if, if, if people want to complain because they haven't learned a new skill and their jobs are being displaced because of that, I mean, these things don't happen overnight, right? This will take time. And it's, it's taking time. Yeah. You know, it's almost a generational change here. I mean, there is, there is no such thing as a job for life anymore. Like years ago, there would have been. Um, and industries, all industries are moving so fast now, not just technology, but innovation in every industry is moving so fast in ways we've never thought of before. So if you're not open to change, that's okay. You can you can be that way, but there has to be a level of expectation setting that there will be some displacement of some type or your job role or form may need to change. Your career trajectory will just naturally deviate or you will unfortunately be pushed gently to one side. It's a fairly polarizing opinion, I know. But you know, change, we've been changing for thousands of years. Why does anybody believe it's going to stop now? And I understand the anxiety for some people that that's uncomfortable, but actually some of the most positive things in life come from great change, certainly in career. And we are so fortunate now that we have the opportunity in the modern world to try our hands at two or three different careers, if you so wished, if not more, in your, in your working life. That's something that some previous generations never had the opportunity to do. So I think actually it's a really fortunate position to be in. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm agreeing with that. Absolutely. I think that, you know, when, you know, I talk a lot about chatbots and stuff like that, because I kind of, I, I kind of studied marketing for a long time and, and I'm kind of really interested in, in the chatbot uh, operative kind of roles. I think that's quite exciting because, you know, then you're going to be like, well, actually this job, it's not just a chatbot operative. You're actually analyzing data, right? So, 
So these people are going to become really sought after, right? Like if you can, because the way that things are going, I don't want to talk to someone. I don't want to phone someone and speak to them or, or, or listen to a recorded message, right? I just want to type a question and I want an answer, right? Uh, so that's just like one example. But there are, there are like absolutely like masses of these examples of, of things that people could just learn about. And I, I talk to loads of people and loads of people are like really like, they're like, oh, I'm really not happy in my job. They say to me quite a lot, actually. And I'm like, well, you know, what, what excites you? Like, what, what, what do you want to learn about, right? Because, you know, we can, you can go and learn about pretty much anything, right? I mean, like you can, you can take a MOOC course, which is like an MIT kind of program. 20 years they've been doing these. They've delivered like millions and millions of hours of free courses to people all over the world. And it's like, well... But, and then the people are like, well, I can't really do anything. It's like, well, yeah, but what do you do with your time, right? Oh, I sit there, I watch, uh, you know, Coronation Street, Emmerdale, or, you know, like just trash, right? They just sit there, watch trash, and then they're like, well, I don't really, I'm not really happy with my life. It's like, but what are you doing about it, right? You could learn anything that you're interested in. And I'm really fascinated by like this way of learning, of of being enthusiastic like a child so you know when we were kids right we we would we would love like we'd find something and we'd be like wow i love this this is really exciting and then and then we'd like just get into it and enjoy that kind of childish uh, enthusiasm in my opinion and i think that can be applied to all areas of tech right like if you look at blockchain you look at um you know ai and automations and and anything you don't have to be a coder right but if you if you're interested in something you read 10 books or 50 books in a couple of years, you're going to know more than like 99% of the population in that sector. Right. Uh, you know, so yeah, it's um, just makes me smile when I, when I think about it, because it's actually that simple, you know, it is, it is that simple. That's purest form. It is that simple. And you know, pick up on your point there about you know, people, about what is time priorities and effectively. As we said earlier on together, you know, people quite happily sit on their phone and browse through Instagram or Facebook for hours on end, but won't invest half an hour in their own personal development. And what you see is that you know, in companies, and every company has these challenges, individuals will, will pass each other at different moments than you expected them to. And what normally sets them apart is that ambition to learn and to further themselves. And we talk about it as trying to create the environment for people to succeed. So we try and create the framework so people have some time where they're, they're given a pocket of time which they can choose what to go and do. And one of the best, I, I sort of picked that up many, many years ago by watching a man called Ricardo Sembler do a speech. And he, talk about, he talks about his terminal days and my other half who listens to this one, I'll be rolling our eyes. But what he basically says is that you know, we imagine as a company, if you were told you have six months to live, what would you do with that time? And you know, you'd go and climb a mountain or learn to play the violin or whatever else. And they take that and they divide that into an hour a week where you're given that hour back to go and do something. And some employees use that to go and further themselves and better themselves. And some use that as vocation. But the overriding change in the business was anybody who took that hour to go and either better themselves or to learn a new skill was more productive because they felt more fulfilled. That option was given to everybody and some people just didn't take it. And those that didn't take it had lower satisfaction they weren't progressing the way they wanted to. They weren't having the engagement they wanted personally and, and professionally. So it's really interesting, actually, if you create the space and time for people to go and do something about personal development or to learn a skill or to read, actually, they will fall, feel more fulfilled and they will benefit themselves both professionally and personally. Wow. I can believe that. I can absolutely believe that. And it's, it's, it's like if you don't do sport, right? And you don't have any hobbies. If if you if you're lacking in in that area, then generally you're going to be you're going to be dis, you know disappointed with your life, aren't you? Really, because you're missing you're missing a key element. And like this is really important. Like sport is like just it's a fundamental thing that you you've got to do. You know. And um, what I want to do is I want to find Pratik a job because you don't know about Pratik, do you? I'm going to tell you, right? So the inspiration behind this series of, of technology jobs, this is with this blow you away, right? So Pratik uh, is, uh, is in India, okay? But he, he actually worked in the UK um, in cybersecurity. He's a penetration tester, right? So, so he's an ethical hacker. Um, and 
And basically, I spoke to him. I've been giving a little bit of encouragement, just coaching him a little bit to kind of just help him in his life. And he's like, well, I really want to go back to the UK and and, uh, and get a job there. And I'm like, OK, so, you know, how, how are you going to do that? Well, you know, I need a visa and I need these things and I need this and I need that. I said, OK. And the beauty of it is Pratik is actually in a wheelchair. Right. And he has a, he uses a one handed keyboard. Right. And and literally, I was just blown away by him as a person. Like he's so inspirational. So yeah, so he's he's actually the inspiration behind this entire series. So I'm trying to help him to to get a route into the UK. So into CyberSec. So if you can kind of point him towards any any directions, like he's looking for a charity to write to do some sort of freelance, like free like uh, volunteering at the moment, because okay. there's a government program that will give him some sort of um, uh, help when he fulfills three three things out of this the criteria they will help him to get they'll give him a visa i think to go back and work in the uk so and and the reason he needs to be there is because he, he basically lives in rural india and he lives in he can't look after himself his mum and dad have to help him but in the uk he's completely self sufficient and it's a, it, it just seeing him talk about this and my goal is to see him learn how to swim. So that was the that was what got my brain thinking about telling you about Pratik, right? And that will be an amazing moment, right? When when I can say, look, I helped Pratik to get a job in the UK and now he's learning how to swim. Like, can you just imagine that, right? It's like, it's like just just incredible. And do you think that that people need this sort of purpose in 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 their jobs? Do you think it makes it makes like their work better? um and and uh, as well as like you know the exercise thing and the hobbies and a meaningful do you think it's like it needs to be meaningful their 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 career or is I that think, is that i think people need to feel fulfilled and whether we phrase that as as the job being meaningful i think it might be in my view slightly wider than that i think it's they need to feel professionally fulfilled or like they're being supported in what they want to be achieving themselves but actually as an individual, I said this to Kim, in someone's moment in life, we're only there for a snapshot of it. We have to remember, we need to try and support that individual you know, outside the professional confine. Everyone's got challenges at home. Everyone's got their own personal and family struggles. And in a commercial environment, in a professional setting, we're only aware of a particular moment of someone's day. I think people need to feel supported and fulfilled outside of the professional bubble but invariably it's it's intrinsically linked right now employers and, and good employers um, i don't like the the term employer and employee but you know, leader and team member is slightly better for me finding people that you can support and grow with is important um, and i think yeah people should feel supported and, and somewhat driven i think it's important just you know to feel valued as well right and people need to feel valued and you only really have that when you you strike that chord of yes, I'm being understood, um, and I feel supported really. And then you sort of feel valued, and you give more. So, yeah, it's it's an important two way principle, I think. It's interesting, isn't it? How we how we sort of investigate like motivation and and stuff like that, right? I know over the last seventeen years, you've you've done all sorts of different roles in different industries, you know, and. And you've 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 also been involved with recruitment, like at a high level, right? Um, so, what what did you learn from that, it, it, like, and, and take into your current like situation, like what you're doing now? Because I know you build you build tech businesses, right, and you grow them, right? So, so what did you learn from recruitment in order to help you to do that? Do you think? I found I used to find recruitment really hard. By our, our arguably one of the hardest areas of business. When I was younger, certainly I really struggled with it. Um, never really put my finger on exactly why that was, but I found it really, really difficult. I mean, everyone says don't employ your friends or family. Actually, I don't agree to that. I mean, I've employed some fantastic friends who have been fantastic supporters and huge advocates. Certainly when times in business have been very, very difficult, they are absolutely fantastic. And I, I'm a complete open book, right? I'm not going to sort of shield people away from things. I'll tell you if it's good. I'll tell you if it's bad. Um, yeah. What have I learned more recently? I do subscribe to the basis that as long as someone is willing and able and they are they possess strong personal skills, you can almost train anybody to do anything with the right level of leadership 
time, support. I think the, the question for businesses is really, are you able or willing to invest the time and energy and support in training that person to do the task or to, to enable them to do the task you'd like them to do? I do subscribe to trying to find people that fit culturally and ethically with what you're trying to achieve as a business. So, you know, in some of our businesses, we're, we're fully remote or fully hybrid and fully flexible. People come and go, they please. We're completely outcome focused. I care about what happens to the business as the outcome, not how you get there. Um, and we employ smart people that can make their own decisions and can do that for themselves. If you possess those sorts of skills, then you're, you're rewarded effectively with flexibility to choose what you want to do when you need to do it. And that, that's fantastic for people, but not everyone can work that way. So some of the things we look for when we're recruiting is you know, people that are driven personally um, and, and are able to communicate clearly what it is they would like out of the relationship as well, because a job is just a relationship, right? It's just got a contract around it. Um, often when you recruit people, we've recruited people, certainly it's a lot of asking about, you know, what we need from the employee, what we need you to do for us. This is the specification. These are the sorts of tasks you'll be completing. We encourage your recruits to ask us questions about what they would like to know. Um, and we do things like trial periods. So you know, come and get to know us. Are we the right hand for the right glove? Who knows if this marriage is going to work? Let's find out. Um, it's stuff like that, which is a bit new. And we, we do this for like five years, right? So this isn't like a new thing. Certainly the new ways now of recruiting are kind of tricky. So we have a development team, a large development team, and a growing development team, and everyone's fully remote. And that's kind of tricky, how you recruit people that you've never even met face to face. I like to shake hands and see people, sort of get a judge of character. It's kind of hard to do that over Teams or Slack. So still overcoming those challenges. And I think that'll be a challenge for a little while longer yet. But certainly I subscribe to the basis of, can I bring someone to the company who fits culturally with what we're trying to achieve? And if yes, then we can help that person fulfill the task or role we need them to fulfill. As long as they're bound culturally, we'll be okay. That's fantastic. Interesting. Michael Tobin says a lot of the similar things, right, about I read one of his books and he talks a lot about, you know, you can because it's hiring people who could be friends or are friends, right, can work really well because then actually your job becomes more fun, right? Because you, you want your friends to succeed. Like this is this is this is the thing Like you want them to do well and they want you to do well. Right. And that's and that's something that can build a great culture, I think. But it's but it's unusual. It's not it's not something that it's not something that m many people actually uh, suggest. Right. But it made me laugh. I talked to, I read his book, one of his books, and he said something about he hired this chap and he's like, right, you're going to do a merger and acquisition. And this guy had never done a merger and acquisition before. Right. And he hired him and he's like, look, you're going to do it. Right. And he's like, sure, I'm going to do it. And he went and he did this M&A. Right. And it was like the first time he'd ever done it. And he listed it. And it was just it was just amazing. And. So, so uh, yeah, I and he says a lot as well about just train, like finding the, the people who are hungry, right? The people that want to get somewhere yeah. and then literally just saying, well, okay, you need to learn this and this. All right, sure, go, go and do it and then get on with it, right? And it's, and it's, it's just linking that together, isn't it? With, with the intrinsic like motivation and excitement of learning, right? Uh, uh, and linking that together. It's, it's fascinating, this, this whole stuff, right? It's just, uh, really really interesting but i think you know a lot of people they're very worried you know but it, i mean i was i was reading this wef thing right and to come back to that they said a recent analysis of jobs across the united states shows that most jobs performed in 2018 did not exist in 1940 right and 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 close to 60 percent of jobs done in 2018 had not been invented in 1940 right so it's so it's like you know there's so many people that are sort of panicking and it's like but actually if you just look at what you're doing now think about you know what you actually enjoy in life and just focus on that then you know and keep learning I think it's gonna be it's gonna be great for a lot of people you know it is I mean, that WF position there is focusing on jobs that are created but also the the other side to that is what industries no longer exist <laughs> at the same time as creating these new spaces. They forget the fact that actually large amounts of positions no longer exist. No industries exist anymore. Coal mining is a falling apart industry. Chimney sweeps don't exist anymore. You know, there's so many things that are falling away, and that's fine. And even if you take a you know, 20 or 30 year progression, look at the last 10 years. You know, look at the rise of social media and some of the roles around those sorts of things. You know, things like social media is an application you interface with. There's an entire ecosystem 
off the back of that, you know, in the marketing side and product development and development itself of application, technology and people and process and all these now integrated applications, that one little drop, one little pebble drop in a river has such a rippling effect. And that's the same for all of these new industries. So we're right on the edge now of things like okay, blockchain development has been around for a little while now. How that's integrated to applications is building a whole nother ecosystem. And while some development jobs, so we don't talk about the technical resource falling away in the industry, there are technical roles that no longer exist. There's a whole bank of programming languages that are no longer in active development. They've fallen out, but they're still used. You don't see many developers qualifying into those areas anymore. So it actually happens even in a smaller field of view. You're just not quite so acutely aware. So you know, I think evolution is going gonna, gonna to keep happening, right? We're in tech and this happens all the time. The roles change, development changes, the layout of the industry changes, individual requirements change, it happens all the time. And over an 80 year period there from the WEF, that's one view. I think you know, on a macroscopic scale, you can probably take a 10 year view of the tech industry and say, actually, if we look at what was happening in 2010 right now, it's a very different place where we are right now. Oh yeah, like the way things have come forward since 2010 has just been insane. Like just just like WordPress is one example, right? That it was awful using back then, like using it as a as someone that doesn't code back then. But now, if you know what you're doing, it's actually really easy platform to use, right? But but people still need help with it. It's just like just because tech improves doesn't mean that those jobs disappear. It means that people still don't want to do them themselves, so they hire someone to do it, right? And it and then your job becomes easier and more fun. Because actually the platforms are kind of better as well, right? So um, quick question. Are you in a rush to scoot off? Cool, cool. So so we we'll talk for like another five, five ten minutes, yeah, on, on, on this, if that's okay. So it's it's interesting, like if you think about like our kids, right? And when when they're gonna when they're gonna say reach the age of twenty, like the jobs that they're doing, they haven't even been invented, most of them, right? And that's that's just that blows my mind like to pieces. Yeah. So so what sort of you know, apart from adaptability, right? Because adaptability is like the it's like key, right? What what sort of I'm not going to say skills, I'm gonna say what sort of abilities, yeah, do you think that 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 you know, young people can kind of nurture so that they're not going to, you know, struggle too much when it get when they get to 20 or something in employment. So some fairly polarizing opinions for me. You'll be shocked to, to hear. <laughs> um, uh, one of the things I think that is no longer developed enough or say nurtured enough is true grit and determination. If something doesn't work out, doesn't just mean you put it down again and walk away from it, right? No one got very far by doing that. So damn well, sit down and stick it out and find a way to make it work. Now, that I, I've got, I, I grew my first company from that exact position. You know, there's, I, there's no one's going to do this for you. So actually get off your ass and make it work. So one of the things you know, sort of telling people is, you know, sometimes it's not going to be okay, right? This is not going to be easy. You're not going to have a perfect life where everything falls into place. It's going to be bloody hard work sometimes, but that's okay. So I think one of the characteristics is actually some true grit and determination and getting out of what is sometimes perceived as a relatively passive, momentary, fleeting culture where you know, you, everything is just for three seconds on Instagram. If you've, got, if you've got a really good idea or you're bitten by the bug or something, go and drive it into the ground for five years. Go and damn well try. Um, the other thing is I think it's... It's slightly lost now, and it, it's conflated with a number of other terms. Is the actual art of lateral thinking properly? So we teach people in technology, and people in technology are sort of, maybe they're more acutely exposed to it. They fall into a hole. And I keep saying to people, you know, you've become siloed. We need to pull you out of being siloed again. Can you, you, you're, you're so good at this here. You've forgotten what's just outside your field of view is there. And actually re-educating people about, okay, how do we take a particular position and think, laterally about it properly that's a unique skill that you know certainly when i was at school you sort of you did the weekend away class if you were lucky you were asked to you know, do you want to go and do sort of further education we don't seem to be doing that anymore too so for me you know, you're right you know problem solving is sort of a thing that should be done automatically anyway really the ability to think laterally about situations not everyone can do that that's kind of hard 
but certainly determination is, is something that is a skill that should really be grown and developed with young people and it's a cultural thing i think yeah it, i i can't agree more on on that determination and grit yeah and it's like if you want to get somewhere and you give up, like look at Edison, right? And he like 10,000 tries to build, to create a light bulb, right? It's like if he'd have given up at like 500 or even a hundred, right? We like someone else would have invented the light bulb and it's, and it is, it's crazy. Yeah. But it's, it's, it's this from, from, from where I sort of sit, I think it's the ability to understand what is happening with your technology and your brain that's that's kind of how i sort of look at things because you know we're in tech right so we understand that we're addicted to screens we understand we're addicted to platforms we're addicted to notifications we're you know even email i mean even the guy that wrote that created the email uh box or whatever for google right he he's addicted to email he said in 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 the social dilemma when i was watching that the other, the other day again for the second time trying to get my daughter to watch the rest of it she's a bit bored of it she wants to watch stranger things instead right which we will we will get back to but it's it's actually quite quite crazy that that we have this sort of it's like we just give up at the first at the first hurdle a lot of the time and and i agree with you completely on that and it's but it's a lot linked to sport right and and the more sport we do the more determined we are and the more focused we can become and we can and we can then just see growth right and achieve things like i'm a big believer in sport like like just massively and uh and you know i mean i have a friend who who you know he cycles a lot right so when he's cycling he doesn't have his mobile phone so i you know i'm into jiu jitsu now and I'm, i ride motorbikes and you know so i don't I, I don't i don't look at my phone for a certain amount of hours per day right and 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 or i go swim or whatever and that's just amazing to like to have that knowledge that you have to remove yourself from these platforms for a substantial amount of time i think is going to help these people because if they can't concentrate how are they going to get a job anyway how are they going to deliver what their boss wants anyway right you know i completely agree i mean I had similar things to you, right? So uh, weekends, or I have my phone on me. I've got two phones. One is for work, one's for personal. Wow. I'm not on social media at all on my personal phone. It's literally just in case someone wow. really needs like a family member. So I won't look on my phone at right. all. I'm two or three tech companies right now. All that have high demands of 24-7 based businesses with distributed teams running complex products in multiple industries. If I can do it, anybody can do it. It's a, If you have to want to do it, and I think that's the thing, really, you have to want to distance yourself from it. Uh, I, well, I'm, I'm constantly to various people. I'm trying to constantly reduce what's in my field of view, right? So I, I'm as anybody else, right? You get distracted. So things that I do, like my phone, has got rid of all its clutter. My, my desktop is completely clear. But I know that I need to remove distractions so I can be productive and do what I need to do. We've all got the same amount of hours in the day. Look at what Elon Musk can achieve, right? And people like that can achieve those sorts of things. You and I can down well achieve a lot more than we are. So. You're, you're absolutely right. It's that distraction principle, I think, is kind of difficult for people these days and that we have to find ways of, of working with it because it's going to be here forever. So we can't sort of say cut it out. It's not not acceptable. It's quite difficult to integrate that, that distraction piece. Yeah, yeah, very much so. So just to finish up, um, what, what what do you think then about people who are perhaps sitting there thinking, you know, well, we know everything and, you know, we, we, we're going to be employed and we don't have to learn anything. Like, what, what do you think about those people? What do you want to tell them? That attitude won't get you very far. <laughs> <laughs> um, honestly, I mean, I, I understand there's some sort of some expectations, right? And I understand where that comes from. I really do. But in order to be successful, in whatever you, you deem as being successful, you need to be a little bit humble and realize that right now you know X and you will need to learn more. If you think you already know everything, you've already lost. No one knows everything. I'm, I'm fortunate enough to have some fantastic mentors and have had done for a while that have accelerated my knowledge in certain areas of business over the last 10 years. But no, they still don't know everything and neither do I. Anybody right now looking for a new career in any industry that already believes they know everything needs to sit down and I think have a, a bit of a think really about what it is they want to get out of the position because that sort of attitude is very difficult for an employer to deal with. Um, and I go as far as to say, 
almost makes you unemployable for some people because you you won't integrate to a wider team very easily. Yeah, yeah, very much so. And and if people are sort of changing jobs and changing careers, I, I don't think they should be scared. Like you know, a lot of people are sort of frightened that they're that they've they don't have skills right in a new in a new industry perhaps or in a new segment. And it's like, well, actually transferable skills are just huge yeah like i mean you you know you're into whiskey right and, and i know a lot about the drinks industry right and so but i'm not in the drinks industry anymore right but like i know a lot about it you know and so there are certain people that can that can just fit really beautifully into into businesses but they just need to ask more questions i think exactly. that's the yeah yeah. You're absolutely right. Yeah. But anybody who's got any experience working in any company adds value massively in any other company. You haven't got to know anything at all about how that company actually operates. You just need the ability to ask questions. And you'll, by asking simple questions, you may help other people crystallize the reasons why they're doing certain things in certain ways. Some of the best C-level executives know nothing about the industry they're a C-level executive of because they have the innate ability to ask questions they genuinely don't know the answer to. They have no ability to reference that answer against is this actually true or false they have to go and find out for themselves which makes them fantastically able c-level executives so you know don't just because you have no transferable skills it's in your view doesn't mean that your receiving employer doesn't believe that there's fantastic benefit to both yourself and the potential employer by knowing nothing at all about the entry you want to move into and communicating that's a really powerful tool very much so. Well, thank you, Tobias. It's, it's, been, it's been a joy. And uh, thanks to everyone for listening. Thanks very much for listening to Influential Visions. Please make sure you share this episode with your friends and business connections. And don't forget to drop us a review wherever you listen. Thanks.